My name's Grace. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Grace. Do you want that? Oh, okay. That, that works. Yeah. Wait, that says 35. Yes, ma'am. You said 30. So you, uh, she gave me five. Um, oh, that's right. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so my name's Grace. I'm an alcoholic. Grace. Hey, Grace. Um, so uh, this is like half of my Halloween costume here. I have a headband. And, but actually, these are clothes that I just recently pulled out of the cult. Um, closet and I said, here's Halloween. So, <laughs> what the hell? Anyways, okay, so what it was like, what happened, what it's like now. Um, yeah, actually, my first meeting that I ever went to was at uh, Cedar Hills Treatment Center. But I want to back up a minute. My childhood sweetheart got married and they had a, a wedding reception at his parents' house. And I found out we couldn't drink there, which really sucked. But we couldn't drink there because his, his dad was a member of AAA. <laughs> okay, that's my knowledge on this program is what I had at that time was Alcoholics Anonymous, AAA. Um, my drinking started when my parents had parties at the house. Mom drank rum and coke, dad drank vodka and orange juice. I liked rum and coke. I liked the feeling. I liked watching people having fun and laugh and have a good time and all of that stuff. And so I couldn't wait till I could be a grown up and I could drink like they did. And I didn't wait till I was grown up. Um, and I started drinking at 12 or something, 12 or 13. Um, and I'm a, I'm a blackout drinker. I'm a binge drinker and blackout drinker. Um, but one of the most powerful things, I'll, I'll bounce around all the time too. One of the most powerful things I want to say that I've ever heard at a meeting was I was in a women's group. They were doing a, a kind of a first step. Everybody was glorifying their, their drunk log. And there was this woman that like almost at the end of the meeting, she introduced herself and she said, I'm an alcoholic. And she said, um, I've never like got kicked out of bars or rode on Harley Davidson's or danced on tables or I've not done these things that you guys are talking about. She said... She said, the thing is, is that when, she said, my husband is a pastor of the church. And when we invite congregation over for dinner, we serve wine. And I drink too much wine and I embarrass my husband. I embarrass our guests and I embarrass myself. I'm an alcoholic. And, you know, I, I heard that and I just went, yeah, you know, it doesn't matter how far down the scale I have gone. If I do things that I normally wouldn't do without those alcohol or those drugs, you know, I have an issue with this stuff. And as I, the longer I stay sober, the more I understand that and the more I believe that I, I belong in these rooms. Um, I earn my seat. So, but, but you know, that God has a, a, a particular way of working with us to get us in these rooms. Um, through a, a friend of mine, I wound up at Cedar Hills Treatment Center as a guest, uh -huh. <laughs> I wasn't a guest guest, I wasn't there, but um, Retton Votech used to have a horticulture class there. And my, my guy roommate at the time was taking a horticulture class and he would come home and he would talk about these people at this treatment center. And he said, there's no fences and there's no guards and they're there to get off of drugs and alcohol. And I said, why? <laughs> why would they want to do, I didn't, I, you know, honest to God, as I'm snorting like, okay, why would they do that? And I really didn't get it. And so he said, well, buy a pizza and bring it up for me at lunchtime and you can meet them in the greenhouse. Um, and so I did. And so, of course, it was this cute guy. And so I started talking to him and he invited me back up. He needed a pair of jeans and he invited me back up to the uh, speaker meeting or something, some kind of meeting. And so I bought this guy at this treatment center because I felt sorry for him. Um, <laughs> uh, Curly Rice, they were cheaper then. And, uh, and I went to the speaker meeting at Cedar Hills and I had no idea it was Alcoholics Anonymous. I had no idea what Alcoholics Anonymous was. I had no idea that I was an alcoholic. I just didn't get none of it. Um, so yeah, so I went back again and he got kicked out of treatment. And we got married, I think three months later. Um, and so my second meeting was at Cedar Hill, or not Cedar Hills, but Serenity Hall at Third and Wells. And I think, I think it was in 83, I'm not really sure, something like that. Um, my daughter was real young. Uh, and so I went to these meetings, but really I was only going because I was gonna fix him, because I could do that, I'm very powerful. And I, and I could fix him. And I just kept going back to those meetings and then I would come up with good reasons to drink. Um, and, you know, I, you know I, I went to the meetings and they really screwed up my drinking because when I did drink, 
you know, I started going, maybe those people are right. And I, uh, and I went down the hall and I went to an al meeting and I listened to them and I went, well, I sure in the hell don't belong in this room. These people are crazy. Um, I have respect for al today. Uh, so I wound up, I wound up coming back into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and I, and I didn't come in and feel all warm and fuzzy and love everybody and feel like I was at home. I was, I was afraid. I was so scared. And I, you know, it's like, for a long time, I said, oh, I just don't like women. Well, it wasn't that I didn't like women. I was scared of them. I didn't know who I was, and I didn't know how to be around them. You know, honestly, I walked in the, I walked in uh, Serenity Hall, and I looked around, and I saw all the guys, and I just went so many men, so little time. What am I going to do? Um, because, you know, and I, and I showed that because that's how sick my brain was when I, when I was out there drinking and, and trying to get sober and trying to figure this out. Um, yeah, so, like... So like I got sober and uh, realized that I, by then I, I have three kids. Um, this one was my drug dealer's kid. And this was uh, the guy that introduced me to Alcoholics Anonymous. We had a couple of boys. And uh, yeah, so I got sober and I started going to meetings. I wouldn't ask anybody to be my sponsor because I didn't trust. I don't want you to know all of that stuff about me. I'm not gonna do that. So I, it took me a really long time Honestly, it took me like 21 years of sobriety to do all 12 steps with one person because I just didn't trust. And that's just, you know, I kept coming back because you guys told me to and I didn't know what else to do. Um, you had that blue book and I and I had kind of like lost all of my my reading skills. And uh, and so I really couldn't read the big book when I came in the rooms and I got a, a dictionary and the big book and I sat down and, you know, because I knew that there was information in that book that I really needed to have. Um, and my, my first husband, you know, he used to get mad and say, God, you're just doing that to piss me off. And I'm like, well, how else am I going to know what this book is about? How do I do this? You know, cause I don't trust anybody to have a sponsor. So I got to figure out this book by myself. Uh, cause that's just kind of like where I came from. So anyways, I, I stayed sober, uh, for seven years. I was married to him and he was introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous when he was 13. He was court order to go to that other program. And after seven years of sobriety, now was I seven years of sobriety? No, I wasn't. I was married to him. I got to ask my husband to go over here. Um, I was married to him for seven years. I put three years together. And I, and I had, in that time, I knew that there was something, that there was more to life, that I'm just not going to be a mom and stay at home and take care of this drunk. I got to, you know, and I'm doing this without a program of recovery. So I'm a crazy bitch, basically. Um, honestly. And, uh, and so I finally, at three years of sobriety, I, I went through a divorce, which I still say is one of the hardest things that I've ever done in my life. Um, cause he introduced me to you guys, you know, and that's pretty cool. So, um, I'm sober. I'm still going to meetings. I have regular groups that I go to. I'm not working with sponsors. I would grab somebody here and there to do a little bit of work. Um, I remember going down to a four step, uh, meeting down in Auburn at the reality center and uh it was a workshop and i did a four step in there and and i had three people on it, it was my mom my dad and, and my first husband and i wouldn't leave until i talked to somebody so that was and so two women came and we talked and and then we went out on the sidewalk and we burned it it was like well okay whatever so i kind of like did what i could do to figure out how to make amends who i needed to make amends to um over the years kind of like by myself and just through like talking with other people. I used you guys as sponsors, people that I heard what you were talking about in meetings and, and people that I could talk to one on one. I've done a couple of four steps with different people, but never followed through on, on all of the steps. Um, so I learned how to read. I, uh, I divorced my husband. I said, what the hell am I going to do now? I have three kids and you know, the drug dealer is not going to pay child support and the other guy can't stay sober long enough. And somebody said, you can go to school. You're a single mom on welfare and you can go to school. And I went, well, shit, okay. So I went up to Green River College and uh, because I'm still not that great of a reader, uh, I wanted to be a mechanic and I wound up in the machine shop program. And that was full, so they put me in welding survey. So I fell in love because welding is like decorating the cake, you know, putting the edges on the sides. Uh, so I became a welder. And, and to me, it's a big part of my recovery because one, not only did I go to school and finish it and get a degree in it, but 
when you're welding, you spend a lot of time with your hood down. You spend a lot of time. I spent a lot of time with a God to my understanding and, and figuring out what you guys were talking about. I've done so much of this. I look back and it's like, I don't know how I'm still sober. I did so much of this on my own. Um, but I did that for 10 years and uh, continued to go to meetings. I took, um, you would see me and I would have all of my school stuff spread out all over the table. I was doing trigonometry and physics and all this. I don't even know how I did it. Um, but I came to meetings and I, and I did my homework in meetings because I had three kids and they would be underneath the table playing with their Legos and cars and transformers uh -huh. or whatever it was. And I took them to hall meetings where I could go and I drug all of them to meetings with me because um, I wanted more for life. I knew that there was more out there for me. Um, so I completed that school and, and I went out and I worked in the field. I didn't realize that I was like groundbreaking, you know, the first woman to work in a lot of uh, well shops because a lot of women weren't doing that. Um, but I really started to kind of like get more comfortable with myself. Somewhere in that time, uh, I went to a, a conference and uh, ran into an old friend uh, that did tattoos, so we exchanged numbers. And as soon as I got home from, I think we were in Ocean Shores, um, he called me and wanted to come over. And I was kicking somebody out the door as this one was calling me because I kind of did relationships a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, and so we wound up uh, dating and then he brought his toothbrush. Um, <laughs> by the grace of God, he was sober. Uh, uh -huh. I think at this time I was around three years, so he was around six years. Yeah, he brought his toothbrush and I went, oh shit. Um, <laughs> but of the other ones that I had dated, they, he liked my kids and he was sober and he, and he seemed to be trying to figure out how to do this stuff as well, you know? Um, yeah, so, and, and he was a welder, so we had a lot to talk about AA and welding. Um, so I wound up moving in with my current husband now of, uh, I don't know how many years we've been married. We've been together for 33 years. Uh, I moved in with Randy and all three of my kids. Um, I continued to go to meetings. I continued to work. Uh, I had a sponsee that came along and, and she wanted me to take her through the steps. I said, I haven't done and she said, well, then we're going to do them together. And so we would meet, um, I can't remember that restaurant up there on Pack Highway in, in Tequila. We would meet there once a week and we went through the steps together. The country something or rather, yeah, whatever that was. We would meet there. And yeah, I forget that. Me and Chris, we went through all those steps together. Um, and she's disappeared. I have no idea where she's at now. I... Um, I got tired of welding. I like to say I got burned out on welding. And uh, I found out I could go back to school and they would still pay me to go to school. So I went back to Highland College and um, was going for a human service degree. And somewhere along this line, I, in the very beginning of getting sober, the very last time, um, I went to a council, I went to, I went to an outpatient place and did an assessment and they asked me about what my husband was doing because he had uh, he had qualified for treatment, like he'd already been to seven treatment centers. Anyways, this, this, this is important because the counselor I had, I said, well, I came down to the group and he, he's at home, passed out, you know, and the kids are at home. And he said, you can't get sober and stay sober and have any quality of sobriety if if he's still drinking, watching your kids, you know, and this is how crazy my life was. He convinced me somehow or another, and this is like willing to go to any lens for sobriety. Um, I sat in his office and I called CPS and I said, I need help. And CPS came into my home and told him he needed to go do treatment. Um, and I said, great, what do I do now? Cause I'm in treatment. I got three kids and uh, they set me up with daycare and they would pick up my kids and take them to daycare for the afternoon so that I could go to meetings. And during that time, I learned how to like do my outpatient treatment and go to meetings. And I, I still remember the golden steer sitting in a restaurant for the first time by myself ordering food. And there was nobody there to ask them what they were gonna have, you know? And so literally I grew up in Alcoholics Anonymous. I really feel like that. I uh, bounce up forward. So I went back to school again. And I got a, a, a degree in human service and somebody said, why don't you go to this treatment? Kristen said, why don't you go to this treatment center 
see if you can volunteer to take the kids out to meetings. And so I went up there and they said, um, you have to be an employee because they're adolescents. And so I wound up going to work for Milam's. And uh, I was a, a I, I like to call them glorified babysitters. That's what they are, mm -hmm. uh, counselors, associate counselors. And I was there for like two weeks and, and I was asked to be a, a, a counselor. And I was at the time I had I had gone from Green River with a bachelor's or with a with an AA degree to Highline with an AA degree, and I was at Evergreen College going for my bachelor's degree. And to pick up on a whole bunch of crap that I'm not going to bother with is I'm the middle of seven kids, and the oldest, the middle, and the youngest are the alcoholics in the family. Um, I'm the only one that's ever gone to college and completed with two AAs and a bachelor. <laughs> This, this I take no credit myself, it's Alcoholics Anonymous. This is what I learned in the program. You guys encouraged me and guided me and kept shoving me forward to keep going in life. And uh, I went back to school and I became a, 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 a drug counselor. I mean, isn't that what people do when they get sober? Um, it's crazy. <laughs> so, I, so I did that. Um, I did that for 10 years and uh, I just uh, had some, had some uh, yeah, I had a surgery and had uh, female stuff removed, and then I became crazy, and I quit. Uh, so I stayed at home. I sat at home, and during that time, my um, my mom had died. My grandmother had passed. Uh, some of Randy's relatives had passed, and I couldn't find much reason to be here anymore. And I really wanted to die. I was laying on this big swing in my backyard and I was just praying to God, just going, I just don't want to do this shit no more, you know? I was sober uh, <coughs> to the best of my ability at that time. I had done things in my life. Um, my kids were all fairly old, getting ready to move out. Uh, I think it was about the time Randy and I had gotten married, uh, but I was still missing a whole bunch. And, and I really wanted to die. Um, he came home one day, and I vaguely remember, uh, I said, I said, I wanna open up a store. I wanna open up a recovery store. And I have no idea where that came from. I didn't buy it, I opened it. <laughs> and, and you know, I mean, it's like, I mean, I came here, I learned how to read, you guys encouraged me to go do these things that I've got to walk through. And I had no idea what I was getting into to open up my own business and all of the finances and all of that stuff that goes along with that. Um, so I did. So I got to spend this time in my, this is why I talk about my, my, um, my, employment because I spent 10 years with the welding hood over my head trying to figure out how to do this recovery stuff and then I went to this treatment center and became a counselor and and I learned more I mean I think they have a good program I learned I learned so much about recovery and I learned so much about myself as being a, um, a human being interacting with other human beings um, and then I and then I opened up this store and I you know I I started dealing with alcoholics, my people, you know, I believe that they're my people. So I got to work with people in patient treatment. I did a little bit of outpatient and then I got to do people in the community and I got to really educate people. People would come in that had no idea what this program was all about. And I got to have some really beautiful, incredible conversations with people about, about recovery because that's, that's what I know. That's what I know. I know, I know the program. I can't, I can't quote the book. Um, I don't ever want to quote the book and know where everything is in there. The, um, yeah, the one thing that I thought about tonight that I really wanted to share was about that, that page in the back of the book, page and a half in the back of the book, about spiritual experience. Because I used to go and sit at events with all of our stuff. And uh, we were down in, I think we were down in Olympia. And they were having a conference. They were, had a panel up there. And they were talking about uh, spiritual experiences. And I heard this woman say, well, I, I don't really know. I haven't really had one in a really long time. And I thought about that. And I, I really wanted to jump up and run in the room and say, what the hell are you talking about? This is a spiritual experience. 
just right here, that we are all sitting in this room together, that we're all a bunch of drunks, drug addicts, whatever we are, wherever we came from, and we're all here now and we're all sober, and nobody's fighting or saying nasty things to each other. That's a spiritual experience to me. You know, in the back of the book, it says, it talks about that change in attitude. And when I came here way back then, you know, it was like, because I didn't get this God thing. Um, I didn't think I was going to be able to do this. I looked at the, the stuff and I, and I had to look up the word serenity because I didn't know what that meant. Um, I kind of remember the Lord's Prayer from my neighbors when I spent the night with them when we were kids. Um, to me, everything is spiritual experience. So um, at 25 or 7 years or something, I was, uh, we used to do a Step 11 meeting in the store and I would read that out of the big book. And as I was reading it, all of a sudden one morning, this is when I really wanted to die. Um, I said, priest, minister, rabbi, how come this doesn't say medicine woman? <laughs> it should say medicine woman. And I understand it's because it was a couple of old white guys that, that wrote the book. And I respect that totally. But I had just met a medicine woman. And uh, Kristen touched on it a little bit, you know, and it says in the book to go out there and seek that help wherever you can. And I've done outside counseling um, and I've gone to different churches to try to understand what that what that's all about. But I had just met a medicine woman. And so long story goes into the last 10 years. Um, I've been traveling to New Mexico uh, doing some studies and I have found you know, it says to, to continue to build your relationship with your higher power. And through through what I've been doing and experiencing, um, I have been able to build that relationship with my higher power. And part of it was that it wound up taking me to, uh, where are they now? Costa Rica. And I did a, uh, uh, what the hell do you call it? Past life regression. Um, and... I mean, that's to me, that's part of Alcoholics Anonymous because I was sober. I would have never gone to Costa Rica had I not been sober, you know. And from this experience that I got to have um, and from all of the information that I've learned in this program, all of my experience, um, I don't want to die anymore. I don't want to die. And, and uh, last year, I, um, two years ago, almost a year and a half ago, whatever it is, I did, I did the store for 11 years. Really grateful that I got to have that experience. Uh, Yeah, um, I don't know. I'm losing my losing my way here. So I got tired. Of, I, I got tired of the store. I you know I loved what what happened there. I loved meeting people. Um, I loved teaching people about some of the information of guiding them into whatever it was. I loved it when four people came in to to buy one coin for one person. Four different people would buy one. Three, you know, it's like oh my god, um, it's none of my business. You know, because that's what they want as for them. Um, there was so much of it. having meetings up there and having people come in. Um, you know, it was it was amazing. We got broke into one time, not too long before I closed, but um, people came in and they were angry. They were really angry. How dare they break into this store of all places? You know, like we had this sacred ground here, you know, and it was like, you know what, we're just, we're just people and they don't give a shit what we're doing in this store, you know, and they're drug addicts or whatever they are, you know, so it's just like, whatever, and it was really beautiful that people uh, donated money. I think the landlord should pay, or the owner should have paid for it, but you know, Alcoholics Anonymous donated money is to replace that, replace that window, and I thought that that was really beautiful. Um, so, where do I want to go? So yeah, so I, I, I loved it, but it was time to go, it was time to quit. I hadn't had a paycheck in, in uh, over 11 years, <laughs> and um, I found out that I was uh, now qualified for Social Security, and so um, it was time to let go and move on. So I, I closed the store. Um, I, I've got to go to Costa Rica. I got to go to um, Spain for ceremony, spiritual experience, and last uh, this, this last August, uh, I traveled all by myself. So growing up in this program, um, I traveled to Turkey all by myself and back, and uh, 
had a wonderful spiritual experience. I mean, these are like ceremonies that I go to. I don't get to go. People go, oh, I have a good vacation. It's like, no, I go in for ceremony and it's working. We're doing, we're doing some good work and it's, and it's helping me to stay sober enough that it's, I've been able to help some other people with that. So, um, yeah, when I, you know, when I thought about that suspect afterwards, it's like, you know, I'm not currently working with anybody. Um, because of the store and where I was at in my life, it was like, um, I, I couldn't. I just couldn't. I, I, I had to take care of what I was doing, and I was doing, and I never looked at it until now I look back and I go, well, that's some service work to show up every day um, and be there for people. So I've done a lot of service work, and uh, this last year and a half has just been taking care of myself spiritually, you know, doing, doing what I need to do. Uh, to stay sober for another day. I've got some women out there somewhere that I think that they just put my name down on paper and that's okay because I'm not going to chase them down. I don't, I don't, it's just my experience. I don't believe in chasing anybody down. If they want to work with me, then they're going to come to me and, and, uh, and put in the effort if I'm going to give them the time. So what I've done, you know, pretty much throughout most of this recovery is I've surrounded my people, myself with people, um, who are sober, who work a program of recovery, who I could pull aside and say, hey, I need to talk to you, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to do this. Uh, yeah, so I've, I've been in this AA bubble for like the last 20 plus years. Um, and I can't imagine not being a part of this program. You know, it's just, it's what we do. When I met Kristen, we were getting up every Sunday morning and going to Little Pat's uh, to Beery and Smokeless Inferno. And when we started going there, uh, there was no, I mean, it was packed. It was, we had uh, breakfast and they had these seats along the side like this here and people would sit there and then they'd trade places to eat breakfast. And I mean, it was a packed meeting. And uh, Randall and I went to that meeting for 25 years. Um, and by the time we went, there was like a handful of people there, but we, you know, we continued to go until it was time to let go of that. I believe in Alcoholics Anonymous. I believe in everything about it. I um, I try to hold back sometimes. I was in a meeting the other night and it was somebody with a cell phone doing this. And it really freaked me out because this is anonymity. This is what I learned. And uh, later I found out that somebody's in the hospital and it was their sponsee. And I had a conversation with the guy and, and one of the guys, home group members, um, the traditions are really important to me, this program, everything about this program is really important to me. And as it tries to shift and change, as, as we shift and change, um, I still don't see any reason why it needs to change because this is Alcoholics Anonymous and this is where I got sober. And there was a lot of old timers that sat in meetings um, that talked about the program. And, you know, I don't know about anybody else. They said, you can't get this by osmosis. And I call it BS on that because I sat there and I listened to every word that they took in. I took in everything that they said and I and I believed in what they said and, and that's how I lived my life. It's a design for living and uh, I do I do my best every day to live the steps and the traditions of this program, you know. And and uh, I had a sponsor that used to just go nuts when I would say I live a life beyond my wildest dreams. I could have never dreamt any of this, you know, that, that I would that I would be in a relationship for thirty three years with one person, that I would raise three kids and they all still like me. <laughs> and I have a 10 year old grandson that, that I'm in love with. We just took a, a week or four days down the Oregon coast, just me and him. We got to live in our car and it was really fun. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, six minutes more, six more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, and, and I know that people come in here and they go, I, you know, I, I do this and I do this and I do this. And, you know, people come in and they, they say, get a sponsor and, you know, go through these steps and do it like this and do it like this. And, and, I, and I love it and I respect it. It just didn't work out for me. I was just too sick and too afraid to do any of that stuff. But the one thing that you guys kept saying was come back, keep coming back. And so no matter what happened in my life, I would come back here and I would share what was going on with me in my life. Uh, somebody in the meeting this morning said something about, you know, you're as sick as your secrets. And I went, oh, yeah, I need to talk about this. I went to, um, I went to get a massage the other day, and it was a new guy. And uh, he's like, oh, so can I use CBD oil? And I said, no. And no controversy, nothing. This is me and my experience, you know. I'm like, if you're going to use CBD oil on me, you're going to do my whole body from head to toe. 
several times because I'm going to get high eventually because that's the addict alcoholic in my head that says, come on, we can do this stuff, you know? Um, and I, you know, I, I have experiences like that, but I also have this design for living and these tools and these things that I can do that I know that that's not okay for me to do. You know, it just, it doesn't work for me. Um, I remember leaving the store one night and, uh, and the husband was out of town and I thought, oh, I could stop. I could stop for a beer. Why would I do that? You know, I, I can't stop for a beer. I don't want to stop for a beer. You know, um, these things jump in my head. I got to Turkey. The you know, I got to Turkey and I went, I landed and I went, I'm in Turkey. I can drink. I think I was thinking of cold turkey. I don't know whatever that whatever that stuff is. Um, wild turkey. See, I don't even know what it's called anymore. But you know, and I just went, why would I want to do that? That would just ruin everything, you know, why I'm here, you know. Um, when I came in this program, I uh, I had a daughter and me. And I had I didn't know what self-respect was, I didn't know what self-esteem was. I didn't know what the serenity prayer was. I didn't know what serenity was, you know, and I, and I've come in here and, uh, because of this program, because of this program, I have this stuff inside here. I have a house. I still don't have a garage. That would be really nice. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, I have, I have a life beyond my wildest dreams. You know, I get to travel. We're talking about going to Mexico soon. Um, I have a host of friends. I have a beautiful relationship with this man and Eli, the grandson. Um, but what I have is, is all this stuff in here. This is, this is so filled up from, from where I was when I walked in the doors, um, that I do love myself, that I do care about myself, that I do, you know, try to respect myself and, and, uh, and commit to myself that I will continue to come back here. It's not for everybody else, but it's for me, you know? And at the same time, by coming back, it's my way of doing service work and saying, you know what, it's possible to stay sober for 35 and a half years, you know? It's, it's, and I'm 64, so, you know, I've been around for a little while, most of my life, You're just a puppy. you know? <laughs> and I am, and I am, you know? And, and I'm totally okay with that, you know? I got to give Larry his 45 year coin the other night. <laughs> You know, I adopted him as my dad in, in the program because my dad died a long time ago and it was a good thing. Um, I was at a meeting on Father's Day and people were talking about their dads and and, uh, and I thought about, you know, all the people and I say, hey, hey, my family's an AA and it's like, who would I pick for my dad? And uh, the following Saturday, I pulled Larry out of the meeting and I said, you need to know this. I need to tell you that of all the people that I know are around this program, that you are the one that I would pick to be my dad. I would pick you to be my dad. I have so much respect for that man. He walks his talk. He's been through hell and back. You know, he shares his truth, and uh, and I love him dearly. And and I'm still trying to learn how to be a daughter to a uh, dad because I don't really know how to do that in a healthy way. Um, but you know, you guys are my family, whether you realize it or not. You know, because my biological family out there is. Um, doing their own thing, whatever that may be. I don't know. I haven't talked to them for a long time. Um, when I came here, my mom said, hey, hey, is it crutch? And I said, I know I'd rather have an alcoholic under each arm carrying me than, you know, than to have a bottle or a rig or, you know, whatever else I was doing. So um, I think that before she passed, she finally came to terms with that. We finally had a good, healthy relationship, as good as it could be. Um, because I always knew that I had it out if I, if I was with her and it didn't go good, I could always come back here, you know? So I've always made sure to have safe places to go. And, you know, I do it, I do it one day at a time and to the best of my ability and I can't do any more than that, you know? And I finally decided it's okay that I'm not perfect. I'm never going to be perfect and I don't want to be perfect. Um, I just want to be amongst my people and you guys are my people. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. You so I love you guys. Thank you so very much. <laughs>